Hey, Link here. Thanks for joining me for episode 82, where I speak of Zalavir Nelson Jr., where we talk about who they are and what they enjoy doing outside of games, how they got into the industry, and wisdom they can share from their experiences, their favorite and perfect games, and some wild lightning round questions. Before we get started, don't forget there are links in the episode description that you can follow to learn more about Zalavir as well as the podcast. Also, don't forget to like and share the episode, and without further ado, enjoy episode 82. Hi, welcome to the Red Tunic Podcast, a podcast where I look to rediscover what makes gaming fun and enjoyable by having positive conversations with those related to the industry. My name is Link, and today I'm joined by Zalabir Nelson Jr., currently running Strange Scaffold, which has recently recently released El Peso Elsewhere, and has personally contributed to projects such as Magic the Gathering and South Park Snow Day. Zalabir, how are you doing today on this very monumental first screw-up for me where I forgot to hit record and we had to restart? I'm doing well. You're doing great. Uh, and the world is on fire, but we are here together. Uh, and that's worth appreciating. You know, I, yes, the world is very much on fire on a personal level. So is mine. Um, but, you know, I am happy that you are here to experience, as you said before that record button got restarted, uh, that you are here to experience my first real personal world on fire with the podcast so thank you for for going through this personal hell with me (laughs) hey uh if there's anyone you want uh, joining you as you go through your first personal hell it's probably the guy who's currently making a horror fantasy kidnapping sim right that's that is that is that is that the calculus is that how it goes uh i you know i i think so i i very much think it is um now, I know it's impossible to capture some of the fire that we recently covered before I forgot to hit record. Uh, a brief for anyone in case it gets referenced was the topic of um, uh, capitalism, late stage capitalism being hell and the counterside to the coin of having to focus on your own personal income, but as a developer, also having to focus on uh, the players not having the same disposable income or time, you know, if they're uh, they have to work more to be able to afford just to to eat. Um, you know, they don't have the time or the money to invest. And the uh, the the philosophical and mindfulness that you put forward to considering that or trying to keep that into consideration. Um, just for anyone that's listening, a very brief rundown of of uh, of what we discussed before I forgot to hit record. Um, now, <laughs> Zalavir, I. Don't actually, I will play it safe with this one. Before we get started, uh, can you tell anyone a little bit about yourself and maybe what you're currently working on for the second time? <laughs> Absolutely. Again, you're you're doing great. My name is Zalvery Nelson Jr. I'm a uh, game developer, studio head, uh, and writer, among other things. I've worked on over ninety games in the past eight years, from indie to AAA. Stuff like Stranger Things VR, which just came out, uh, and South Park Snow Day, all, all the way to Magic the Gathering and games like Space Warlord Organ Trading Simulator. Right now, uh, my studio, Strange Scaffold, is working on a number of things. We've been alive for five years, just hit our five-year anniversary. And the two games that we've talked about publicly uh and revealed names for because we also have a game called project beast a really exciting first person shooter we're going to have more details about soon but uh the two games we talked about publicly are life eater a horror fantasy kidnapping sim about a druid living in modern day suburbia who kidnaps and sacrifices people to delay the end of the world on the behalf of a god that he isn't sure exists as well as teenage demon slayer society uh a game about rad teens beating up demons in their hometown because uh, the adults didn't do it for them. It's a turn-based tactics. Uh, sorry, it's a turn-based uh, character action game, uh, character action tactics game, which basically brings the verve of Devil May Cry to the accessibility of a turn-based format. Something you've 
really genuinely never played before. So lots of cool stuff I'm making. Uh, I'm also learning to line dance and one step and two step these days. So if anyone ever wants to get real, uh, get some real movement around country music, uh, give me a call. So, you know, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, that's, that's wonderful, uh, to hear that you are getting into, um, to, to, to learning how to do one and two step. I learned country dance one day in elementary school and all of it's gone in my head and hopefully for you it sticks around a little longer than it heads for me <laughs> yeah i've been doing it for a few months now and it does feel slightly ingrained into my soul i've learned something like 30 line dances at this point uh it's it's been amazing for me and it's a hobby that as much as i love games and i make it a practice to try to play games and new games uh and by new games i mean new games to me uh practically every day uh as a matter of research as well as enjoying the art form and seeing how much it adds to me as a person uh it is really nice to have a deep hobby and passion that is not connected to a screen you know, I, I usually reserve this question for the end. However, you know, we're kind of here, so I'm going to just throw it out now. Just, you know, why not? So usually I like to ask about who you are outside of outside of gaming, um, you know, your hobbies, your passions and whatnot. And, you know, since we're kind of here talking about it, um, what made you look at uh, line dancing and think to yourself this is the thing i want to try and get into that isn't that isn't gaming that isn't going to keep me in front of a computer so line dancing one step two step poker waltz i kind of just gave it a shot uh in general before the pandemic and lockdown i hadn't done a lot of in-person activities. I had managed to do a lot of really cool travel and so on and so forth, but I had never been to a concert. I had never been to a comedy show. I had never appreciated or seen uh, live music and performance. I had never danced. I was like, yeah, I can't dance. And then I just kind of kept myself there in that box. And after lockdown ended, I said, man, there's a degree to which I've really kept myself back as both an artist and a human being by setting all of these weird arbitrary limits around what I could and could not do and what I would and would not see. So I started going to concerts. I started going to punk shows and house shows. I moshed for the first time, even though that was very scary. It looked like <laughs> uh, uh, violent white people nonsense. I <laughs> uh, gave it a shot and discovered something really valuable there. And pretty close to me, considering I live in El Paso, Texas, which is why we made a game called El Paso Elsewhere. Uh, there's ways to two-step one step and line dance that are very close to me and i was like you know what i'm gonna give it a shot i'm gonna try this other thing and compared to music which i haven't really super tried to learn an instrument but every time i have started to approach that it hasn't gone well it doesn't make me happy uh dancing though the way it clicked with my brain and the way that it was like, okay, I'm bad at this, but if I keep doing this, the way my body moves changes, the way my body is shaped literally changes and has changed. Uh, the, the, the physical satisfaction and the learning curve of dancing and gradually getting better at dancing was so transformative that yeah, it has bent and altered my entire perspective. Now I'm looking at doing more dance styles like swing and uh, salsa next. But yeah, it, it, it giving it, it was a matter of giving things I thought I had no chance of doing or being a shot and discovering 
by accident a, a deep and great passion. These days, I try to, when I encounter the new and unfamiliar, I try to give it a solid try, uh, or at the very least, witness the thing, because I've seen how much saying yes to the scary can benefit and enrich a life now. So I'm happy to hear that, you know, you're having such a great time with it, that, you know, that putting yourself out there to do something you, you're, you haven't, you know, that you, you know, you never did before or what have you is having such positive returns on your life. I think that's, uh, I think that's like a great thing. And I think a lot of people, uh, can, can definitely relate to the idea of personal and so self, self growth and how it like manifests in the ways that it manifests. Right. Cause you know, in a lot of ways you might not be expecting it to have the the kind of impact that it does you know like the the um the the like the straight up and down of doing something like dancing right you're you know you're gonna work your body out in different ways you know it's gonna it's gonna have like a change there however um i would also presume like just the the idea of like a rhythm now uh seeming more natural and like just the you know the 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 everything else that goes with just not being you know a little thinner or or whatever however you want to like whatever it does is probably just a really cool thing and a really great thing and you know in terms of how it clicks and manifests in your brain as what it represents right like as you had mentioned uh trying to learn instruments or play music and it not clicking in the same way but then like you learn different your brain makes different pathways which then lets you solve different problems in different ways because these pathways that just for whatever reason didn't exist now exist due to really weird reasons um i hope that makes sense to to me it makes sense because that kind of i've seen it work that way for me but i don't know if i've just been gibbering nonsense the i think one of the most interesting pieces about what you've mentioned not to plug our own stuff but it's a huge part of why the strange scaffold portfolio is so varied. We don't just do make horror games. We don't just make action games. We make games like an airport for aliens currently run by dogs, an open world comedy adventure game. And the reason we do that is partially because be it's really exciting to me that players might give a genre a shot because they're like, well, I really like the rest of the studios games. Well, I'll, I'll see what they've made, done here and maybe discover something that they didn't know they loved before. And that's also been my experience with games as I pushed myself to stretch over the past decade, really. I was like, oh, I don't like horror games. I don't like survival horror games. I don't like specific franchises like Resident Evil. And then I discover <laughs> a new piece of my brain and existence as a as a result of opening that door and giving it an honest shot to at minimum appreciate what people do love about these things. Everybody loves a game or piece of art for a reason. And now I've at least discovered from my personal perspective that for some reason, uh, God has embedded in me a deep passion to understand why people love things and to acknowledge those things with like a real respect and dignity. So thank you. I'm thank you for sharing that. And I'm happy that you have a, uh, a way to uh, more focusedly, if that's a word, we'll pretend it is um, <laughs> to, to go with what I was like the direction that I was saying, I don't think I w was ever going to be as eloquent or um, specific uh as you just were but thank you i very much appreciate appreciate it and i am curious for anyone that you know is hearing okay well the 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 full name of line dance one step two step uh what have you what have you um if anyone was like well you know zalavir seems to think this is cool and he's enjoying himself maybe i would like to is there a uh is there a a, a dance a step uh, i'm just gonna say a dance a form what have you that you would say this is the one that you think is the most beginner friendly that you had the most fun with? I, I hope what I'm asking makes sense. <laughs> yeah, if I understand the question correctly, uh, if someone wants to get into line dancing or 
two-stepping what's a good dance to start with yes uh there is as so one step two step country polka and country waltz are different than line dancing but if you're going to go for line dancing specifically there is a dance called uh the whippet which is really really fun i'd also say uh there's a the the dance that really clicked for me that i want to keep doing this was uh it's called the church clap and <laughs> uh it does involve launching yourself across a room uh at high speed while clapping between your legs uh but holy cow at, at minimum discovering that that's something you can do and you can do on a rhythm and that it's actually not as difficult and arcane as maybe like really expert dancers will make it seem because they're among other things, putting a lot of flavor and sauce on it. It's empowering. And I think there's a lot of dark things in the world. We can and should get our sources of, of healthy empowerment wherever we can. So, yes, I, I understand and agree with what you're saying there. However, my brain is far more concerned or not concerned far more screaming at me to to say this um so i apologize not to be dismissive however on the topic of crazy white people stuff or however you phrased it earlier um the church clap very much sounds exactly like crazy white people stuff <laughs> i mean it 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 starts with like some solid uh it starts with some real solid rhythm, some real solid just moving and swaying, uh, and then the entire song escalates. Uh, the song is also apparently by a, a black person, I think. So uh, the so absurd rhythmic nonsense is not only limited uh, to uh, one race or another. It is. Uh, it is a journey that we all go on in some way or another, much like every civilization has their specific flavor of what if we took a starch and we wrapped it around uh, some sort of meaty, sweet, or vegetable-based filling and then fried it? Wouldn't that be the best thing ever? Uh, and every single time that humanity has said that to itself, it, they've been right. <laughs> so... Yes, thank you. There's a joke here I could make. I am not funny enough to make that joke. Um, I'm just going to acknowledge the joke so I can feel good about myself and move on. Um, <laughs> now, hell of here. Um, is, can you speak to how it is you got into developing and making games and also maybe some wisdom uh, that you have learned from your experiences that you, could, you know, would be happy to share? About making games? Uh, your, your, about your journey about into it or, or what have you for people that maybe, um, I know, and I know that this is also always tricky to say or ask because, um, the industry and, uh, many of the entry points or lessons learned from the industry are very much time based on when or how you got into it. Right. Uh, but it would be, you know, and along the lines of, you know, like, um, uh, if, you know, if there's something you had, uh, a hard time with. Uh, and it wasn't until like a few years in that you went, oh, hey, if I had known this, if only I had known this now kind of thing in terms of, you know, how to think of the words of wisdom kind of question, you know? Every single job I've ever gotten came from doing the thing first, doing the thing with whatever resources and tools I had at hand to whatever scale I could do it without destroying myself in the process just doing the thing is what not just brought me the joy and satisfaction of creation, but then in often quick succession afterwards, opportunities to continue doing that stuff professionally and with collaborators. So I started as a games journalist in the industry about 14 years ago, and I was actually going to leave games, but I decided I would make a game first and I didn't know how to use anything like Unity or Unreal. Uh, tutorials did exist, but that felt pretty big for me. So I found out that there was a 
tool for making games called Twine that was interactive fiction that was mainly HTML, CSS based. And as a journalist, I had worked with HTML. I, I knew how to put at minimum, you know, tags around a word to make it jiggle or make it bold or italicized or whatever. So I just started doing that. And that got me hooked on the process of being like, dang, I'm going to stay in games because the process of making games is actually really enjoyable. And it led to people hiring me. So when people ask me about how I've now gotten into writing comics professionally or really anything, all I can do is point to a time where, you know, a lot of luck comes in here as well as the grace of God. But I also just got to point at a time and say, hey, particularly if you don't come from a privileged background, there's got to be a moment where you just said you're going to do it. And then you did it. And then you defined your voice and career from there. So I, 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 every time I do find myself at a career doldrums, I have to remind myself of this comics being the best example of this. I always, always wanted to get into writing comics, but I never did. Uh, and the idea of writing comics seemed out of reach. And then I was like, oh, shoot, I'll just do the thing that I've literally done like three, four times in a row now and just start. So I found some collaborators. I looked up fair rates to pay some artists. I looked up comic templates and I'd been reading comics and reading comic script examples for years. And I wrote some dang comics and I put them into the world and they ended up being best-selling uh, comic releases on itch.io. And that's led to me writing other comics professionally. So yeah, long story short, just do the thing with whatever you've got at hand. It's valid and it often will result in opportunities because there's a legion of people who want to do the exact same thing you want. And the difference between you and them is that you're the person who just started. So th that is beautiful advice. Thank you very much. And, you know, I, it's, it's not, it's not, you know, brand new advice. That's similar advice that has been given a lot. And I'm always happy to hear um, how it's the, how it's like, you know, this, the general topic of just do it, but how just doing it manifests itself and how it, like how each person does that and hearing that, you know, that your approach or your view is, you know, every time you want to do something and you think, well, last time I just did it and it worked right this time, I'm just going to do it and it'll, it could work. And you know, the, 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 not, not to try and create like an, a me versus them mentality. However, also keep in, keeping in mind that the difference between you wanting to do a thing and someone else wanting to do a thing is you doing that thing. Like, you know, you can't, you can't get to the store unless you walk out the door and to keep taking those steps. Right. So, you know, thank you for that advice. I, I always love hearing it. And it's, you know, it's, it's, I always love hearing similar advice because it's, it really hammers home that, um, at the end of the day, the tried, the tested, the true advice, uh, is, is a real good way to go. Cause a lot, you know, some people like myself, I can say to this, you know, I exist in my head a lot and I spend too much time thinking and trying to go, well, how can I do this? How can I do that? And having more people just say, just do it. Just, just do the damn thing. It, I, I think it's beautiful advice because I, and I'm sure people like me benefit from hearing, just walk out the damn door, just walk to the store, just take one step until you're there. You know, so thank you. I, I always love that advice and I appreciate it. You're very welcome. And, and, and one other thing I would say, just as a very small addendum, is if you uh, – I'm, I, I'm, I'm just thinking real quick. One other thing I would note is doing it at whatever scale you're at is also a really good time and opportunity to learn if you don't want to do it because let me tell you i have friends who have ascended to being lead and director level people in a given discipline or skill and then said well dang 
I got my foot in the door and I did this thing, but I actually didn't enjoy it. And I actually wanted to do this entire other different thing the entire time. And they're starting from scratch uh, on these new skills and disciplines that actually bring them joy. You have to look not just for getting your foot in the door, but for what processes make you happy. And if, for example, you're like, I want to be a level designer. And then just with whatever tools you have at hand, you start doing level design and you don't enjoy it. It's not going to get better <laughs> if you're doing level design for Naughty Dog. You're still going to be having a bad time. So it's better for you to learn that you despise a certain type of work or process before you get in through the door of the big show. Just do the thing. You'll learn, a, at minimum, you'll learn a lot about yourself. So again, Zellabir, I, I thank you. That is a beautiful addendum to it. And I think, you know, that, yes, I, I understand from personal experience and from, you know, similar advice that I have given as well in terms of, um, you know, not, you know, figuring out what you want to do before you do it. Yours is a much more actualized and intelligent way to do it <laughs> instead of thinking on it, but actually, you know, try and make a level before you decide that's what you want to do, right? Um, but no, I thank you again. Uh, uh, the addendum, uh, uh, beautiful advice as well. The whole, the whole package, very, very nice. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. So I do want to ask this one. Um, now I'm. I don't know how this one's going to go. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoil the question with this. If we get there, we'll get there. And if not, I'll ask about it anyway. But um, do you have a favorite game or favorite games? Uh, and you know what it is about those that you go, Gab, this is the thing. This is the one or ones, you know? So you mentioned spoilers. Am I not supposed to say the name of the games? Oh no 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 no! Um, sorry, I I, uh, I spoiler was the wrong word. Leading question is how I should have phrased. It. I don't want to lead the question because I, I have a I don't know if this is going to go in a certain direction. Um, and if it does, great. If it doesn't, I'm going to ask about it anyway. So that's what I meant. I didn't want to have a leading question. Spoiler gotcha. was the wrong word. Sorry about that. No worries at all. Um, there's a few games. What I say instead of favorite game or favorite movie is perfect game or perfect movie. The idea of there's a lot of beautiful art in the world mm -hmm. and there, are, but there are some things that to even define them from my favorites, it's like, Oh, this is such a perfect example of the form or of these ideals or principles that, uh, I can't help but kind of marvel at it. It is it is a masterpiece. It is something that deeply Im impacts me, and it's something that I can show to anyone and say, this is what a good movie looks like. Uh, and sometimes it's a big, known, cool thing, and sometimes it's something like Gross Point Blank, a movie about John Cusack as a hitman going to his high school reunion. Uh... The idea of uh, a favorite game is is tough for me because I've played a lot, but I'd say some of my favorites are definitely in the horror genre, and that wasn't the case for a long time. But it was, again, opening myself to being willing to try those experiences that led to me finding them. So The Evil Within 2 was a divisive game. It came after... Uh, or rather, it came after a divisive game, and so a lot of people didn't necessarily give it a shot. But its perspective of what an open world game can be was so brilliant and visionary, and really subtle in the powerful design decisions that it was making, that I fell head over heels in love. I say the same thing about Resident Evil Seven. Uh, Recently, I've been playing Chrono Trigger, which I didn't think I liked JRPGs. I haven't really played one that super grabbed me, although I did appreciate Paper Mario and uh, the, the Origami King, I believe is the name of it, is one of my favorite games. It was so clever. It didn't get 
the attention it deserved for how clever it was. Uh, and I thought based off of not liking a lot of other JRPGs or JRPG traits that like, oh, I'm a JRPG gamer. Chrono Trigger, everyone says it's the best JRPG, but if it's the best of a thing that I don't like, then I don't like it. And I had to tell myself, okay, you're you're being an asshole again. Uh, sorry, you're being a jerk again. Uh, give Chrono Trigger a shot. Know what you're missing out on, at least. And Chrono Trigger has become one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, I think about games like... There was one that I just had in my head, but I think I've lost it now. I didn't think I liked character action games for a while. And then I tried Bayonetta, and I was like, oh. And then I would played Devil May Cry 4. I hadn't played Devil May Cry 1. And I went back and I played Devil May Cry 1, and I was like, oh, I can see where the lineage comes from in terms of starting as a survival horror game. I All of these things that I liked in principle about character action games but because of the high level of execution and uh combo learning that was involved i was like oh this genre isn't for me i'm rambling quite a bit now but every time i say that a genre isn't for me and then i give it a shot anyway and find some sort of exemplar whether or not it's a well-known one i end up becoming a better artist and person and often it becomes the foundation of a new game like teen steven slayer society was directly the result of me going like man i'm a tired adult uh i don't have the reflexes it feels even as a younger adult to really play these games at the highest level so i'm gonna make all of that special feeling and vibes available but in a format that anyone can play which is a turn-based game you don't have to be a uh, a button wizard anymore to play a character action game for teenage demon slayer society you just gotta be able to to think cool and to look uh and to have the idea of looking stylish while fighting in combat so yeah, I I have a lot of favorite games. I have a rotation of things that have meant a lot to me. Peter G- Jackson's King Kong is high up the list. Uh, and my favorite games are almost always things that have forced me to expand my perspective in some way or taught me something. So thank you for, for sharing for sharing that. And, you know, I I don't know. Yeah, if apologies I've that rambled a bit. Oh, look, there you no one ever needs to apologize for rambling. This is a conversation. I I am not a journalist. I would be a horrible journalist. So, you know, I'm <laughs> never going to stand on form of how an interview, quote unquote, should work. So, no, you you are very good. Um, but I, you know, thank you for sharing that. and it's interesting to hear um, you know, how you're how putting yourself into the genre that you aren't really comfortable with leads to those discoveries and it kind of loops back to you know the 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 mindset or what have you of self-growth um in different ways for this one and also i do want to note before stepping a little further into that um that the uh the topic of uh, uh, a favorite game uh, or favorite games uh i would like to, i'd like to say, i don't know if i've said this in recording or not however i am aware of how dirty of a question that is because it's such because like as you basically you know spoke to it's such a hard question to actually answer you know gun to my head uh if someone said you know what's your favorite game i would also have the response of in what way right like uh so i appreciate gun to my head i i kind of discovered in real time my answer it's 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 the evil within two or Peter Jackson's King Kong. It's probably Peter... No, nope, it's Peter <laughs> Jackson's King Kong. Don't shoot me. It's Peter Jackson's King Kong. Oh, so, thank you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll put the the uh, theoretical uh, or literally literary gun away here or what have you. Um, but no, I very much understand the, uh, the, the difficulty of that question, and I appreciate you wading through it with me. Um, now, to speak to what I said before... 
the conversation or the topic of not leading the question, um, I was very curious if Chrono Trigger was going to be up there, only because you've been tweeting about it as you've been experiencing it. And uh, as someone that has not, as someone that doesn't speak in the same direct way as you did with favorite versus perfect game, um, I was very much looking forward to hearing you know, well, I was been very much looking forward to reading your thoughts on Chrono Trigger, only because for me, it is uh, it is a perfect game in the sense that when I'm talking favorite games, when I think favorite games, Chrono Trigger does not exist in those lists for me because I feel it would poison whatever well anything else exists in only because um, how masterful it is then that's my opinion i'm not trying to impose that on you however i'm just saying i was very much no. curious and looking forward uh have been looking forward to reading your um experiences with it you know i'm at the final boss and i agree with you where it was a thing of like man i've never liked a jrpg and then chrono trigger kicks down the door and it does all of the things that most jrpgs attempt but good <laughs> like i respect the jrpg genre especially after having played chrono trigger and i acknowledge that it has a lot of value and that a lot of its uh comfort and sort of standards uh are assembled with care by a lot of very talented teams but chrono trigger i mean compare the the typical jrpg arc of like three to five hours in the intro uh the idea of okay once you get past that intro you're slowly building up the your your skills in these turn-based battles and there is a pretty obvious baddie but the the answer to why they're the baddie and how this world came to be can be delivered via expo by by exposition dumps and a kind of laborious journey and search uh, I tried playing the latest J Dragon Quest, which I have been told is one of the greatest JRPGs ever. I could see all of the care with which it was assembled, but the psychology of how I was supposed to play it felt like it was rooted in decades of history, which it was, that I wasn't exposed to by the design of the game. The, the game expected me to know that, and also the game itself didn't grab me after like an hour or two of my human lifespan. So I was like, I'm not going to continue with this. Maybe there is a road to play it more down the road, but I, uh, for my own sanity, uh, there's a Guillermo del Toro uh, quote, which is, uh, I do not make life homework. And I was like, I'm not going to make this homework. I'm just going to respect that this isn't for me. And then, Jer and then Chrono Trigger comes in <laughs> within an hour you're fighting vampire nuns. Uh, you have traveled through time. You fought a big robot who sings and then gives you points. You've been robbed by a uh, a carny without hands, just a floating, laughing mask. Uh, you've bet <laughs> on a sports competition. You've uh, discovered a a monster, a monstrous conspiracy. Hundreds of years in the past? All that happens in the first hour. And it does it in a characterful, fun, really well-written, written, and often deeply funny way. And when I compare that to a lot of other experiences that are beloved in the JRPG genre, but don't have that speed and that expertise and that way of teaching you how to play as you play... Uh, the TP system is, I still think, one of the most masterful gameplay systems I've ever seen. Because I often, when previously trying to play uh, JRPGs, I was like, how often do I use my cool special stuff? And the answer in Chrono Trigger is, all the time, or you're going to die. And that, it's just really good, and it shows you that through its pure economy of using your abilities. Like, I... I love Crow Trigger. I love Crow Trigger. It's so well designed and it is a JRPG that doesn't take for granted that you're going to play it because it is in your favorite genre. It says, no, you need to play this game because guess what? 
this robot sings. This robot sings. It <laughs> sings a little song about how if you beat it, you'll get 15 points and you can use it to to turn into gold at the little stand run by uh, a happy little man. And so you beat that robot and you get 15 points and you turn it at the stand or you negotiate with the terrifying Cardi without uh, a, a body. And it's 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 so good. It's so compelling from the off, and it doesn't take that for granted, which brings that to Persona 3 Portable, which has been <laughs> one of my design touchstones for years. I played it not knowing what to expect. It poisons the well for every other Persona game because it's efficiency. It's uh, it not taking for granted that you're going to be invested in this story or in this world or in this style of gameplay and these choices so it doles it out fast it gets right to the heart of the point and it gets you invested in that world and that those characters really quickly and it justifies why they're there and it teaches you its combat system in such a precise and elegant way that is calculated to more so than anything again answer the question of why do you care why do you care about the combat? Why do you care about these, these, this world and these systems? How do we get you making decisions that feel meaningful as early as possible? Persona 3 Portable blows so many games of so many genres out of the water uh, and got me heavily invested. And then I played the other Persona games and did not have as good of a time. So... Thank you for, for all that. I'm always happy to hear anyone wax lyrical on Chrono Trigger because uh, like any game that people are enjoying or are passionate about, it's always going to be something different, right? Like I, yeah. I will, I'll listen to anyone talk about why Ocarina of Time or what have you is one of their favorite games because it's always different and there's always ways to relate. And, you know, for, for Chrono Trigger, I'm happy to hear that that opening was such a grip, like was able to take such a grip on you because you know, for all the things to love about Chrono Trigger, that is a very fair one. And a very, as you like discussed and talked about, one that from a player perspective is probably overlooked. And I say player perspective in the sense of someone that doesn't really think on what makes a game a good game or, or, or what have you, right? Like, um, you know, yeah. it's no, it's no shock to say that people that make games or what have you or uh, what, or what not, look at things differently than just, you know, people that casually or even seriously play them, that there's a different, uh, a different angle that they see. So it's, I always love it. And, you know, thank you for sharing all of that. And, you know, it's interesting to hear for Persona 3 Portable. But the more interesting thing to me is that the, it was the, what I'm going to say or assume, because, you know, I don't know if you've tried Persona 3 or Persona 3 Fez or even Reload, but the uh, what is most likely the things you like the most come from them having to cut it down to work on the PlayStation Portable. And I I think that's really interesting too, because, you know, the, the efficiencies and like some of those um, shortcuts that probably do not exist uh, in the, the subsequent ones um, that you, you know, that you indicated that you tried and didn't click with. Um, I find that interesting just because for me though, that, that didn't click that, you know, that's one of the reasons I did not get on the portable bandwagon, uh, when it first came out at the same vein, that's probably cause I had, you know, by that point I had just beaten like persona three, including the Fez uh, festival expansion, like three times in like succession. So yeah, that could be part of it, but uh, burnout is real for JRPGs, which I'm hoping you, well, it sounds like you're not going to have to learn the hard way, which is. Uh, a blessing you know it'll mean you aren't as um uh uh jaded or biased against them I, I i imagine that would make sense to you i'm sure it makes sense to anyone else that plays a lot of jrpgs as well i've i've heard of this from other jrpg players and yeah you're exactly right i in persona 3 is a perfect example because like what i care about is i i want to know at a glance, hey, where is all the people who are the social links that I can reach at this day? Where yeah. are they? And when they rendered that down to being 2D spaces, 
where with icons explicitly to show you, hey, here's a new person here today. And it's really easy to look through your full list of choices uh, by going between the different locations through a 2D overworld. And with a quick menu, searching all the different places and saying, okay, with full information and context, I want to talk to this person on this day to increase this social link in my wider set of choices. As soon as in Persona 4 and Persona 5, which were also, uh, at least Persona 4 uh, Golden was made to fit a portable format, but it was the full thing still. Uh, as soon as I had to walk between places, and I had to like scan the screen to look for big exclamation points uh, and tr tried to figure out my choice space from there. And the fact that Persona 4 in particular didn't really give you many choice points for at least, I played that game for like five hours and I don't think I had made a choice by the end of that five hours. I was still just in the intro arc, just learning and tutorializing systems and world and characters and the beginning of character arcs. Uh, yeah, Persona 3 Portable compared to that was an adrenaline hit. It was so good. <laughs> I so, think Persona, uh, not Persona, but Pac-Man. Pac-Man Championship Edition DX Plus, specifically, also pulled this off of saying, what's the heart of a thing? And either altering that in a way that was subversive and novel, or saying, I'm going to show you something knew about this thing that you loved before. So, uh, are you familiar with Pac-Man Championship, <laughs> Championship Edition DX Plus? I, I don't know for certain, but I believe so. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but these are the ones that if you, the, the big flashy special ones that exist on like, um, the PS4 or what have you now, um, uh, more recent years. And they are, um, how do I put it? Uh, it's like if you were playing Pac-Man on speed and LSD. A little bit, yeah. In Championship Edition DX Plus in particular, the game loop is less about uh, a pure avoidance and grabbing the uh, the the what do they do they call it dots or pellets? Because I, I know there's a power pellets. pellet. Okay, pellets. So. It's less about collecting all the pellets and figuring out route optimization and so on and so forth. And uh, it turns the game loop into... It, it takes that game loop. I love distillations of genres, and I also love, like, elaborations or subversions of genres. And in this case, this is a subversion of one of the most legendary games of all time. It says, hey, ghosts are a thing in Pac-Man. What if all of the ghosts... Uh, each time a ghost saw you, it got added to your conga line. And then there, there's just a ghost in the conga line behind you. And if you ever run into your train of ghosts that you have assembled, you die. So it's a little bit of Pac-Man plus Snake. And once you pick get a power pallet, you can just turn around behind you and get this giant chomp chain of dozens and dozens of ghosts that you've collected. And it becomes riskier and riskier. And you're uh, to, to, to maintain that train, the longer it gets... And so it does still, at the end of the day, become a game about route optimization and avoidance and really intelligent and skillful, sometimes split-second play, but it does it in this uh, format that inherently turns it on its head and makes it, as you said, a speed and LSD-based kaleidoscope of lights and sounds and decisions. Uh, that grabs you immediately. I putting some uh, Pac-Man in front of a modern child. I don't think I could do that and explain why it was important <laughs> and compelling compared to Fortnite without going into a little bit of a history lesson and explaining how they're supposed to play the game and what the game does. And even then, it might not grab them. I can put Pac-Man Championship Edition DX Plus in front of anyone, young or old gamer or not and they will be lost in the colors and sound and at minimum if they don't fall in love with the game that doesn't matter because their body will have been sucked into the television 
and they will have been cleansed from this world, as we would hope is the fate for anyone who doesn't love Pac-Man Championship Edition DX+. Plus. So, thank you. Yes, um, I'm happy that I was correct on what game uh, that you were you were talking about. Um, and <laughs> I I will say that, yes, I understand what you're saying about, about it. Because um, I, I got into a loop of playing it for, I'd say, like, you know, 10, 15 minutes every day for a few weeks. And it was, you know, the, the uh, insanity of it, you know, because I'm, I'm 36. I played my share of Pac-Man games, um, whether it was the actual Pac-Man or Miss Pac-Man or what have you, what have you, what have you in, you know, the handful of arcades that I've been to or, or you know, on the handful of a co- a consoles that I played that had the base game and whatnot. And the, for me, sitting down to play it, it was, you know, eyes bright going crazy because it was such a shift that was still fundamentally-ish, the same game, but now it was this, like, wild remixed evolution. And, you know, what you're saying about it, it makes me, um, for, for context for the next part, my father, um, years ago, we went to, we went to PAX, uh, PAX South, and they had one of those uh, arcade booths and pac-man was playing uh, you know one of the multi arcade things and for pac-man he was talking about the um the strategy that you know the oh yeah red uh, he still remembered their names my father does not remember my birthday or his birthday but he remembered the strategies for dealing with each of the four ghosts and their name so he was talking about this as he's playing. He's like, yeah, I'm going to go this way. Then I'm going to go up. And when I go up, this one's going to do this. This one's going to do this. The one that's way off in the corner is scared of me all the time. It's going to do this. And he was saying everything it was going to do while he was aggressively smashing this reproduction joystick around, which I had to, you know, be like, hey, hey, this isn't yours. Don't break the, don't break someone else's stuff. <laughs> um, but the realization that I probably should make sure he's aware of this game now exists because um i it's something that he would love you know and it's something that i like you said anyone that's enjoyed pac-man or just people in general because it's such a wild experience uh would love but um but yeah dad if you're listening um play that game if i haven't sent it to you yet um (laughs) there's my safety that i don't have if i forget to tell him um anyway but no zelavir that is a fantastic you know uh, uh a path down for for the games and the remixes and talking about the things that uh hook you while making the game better while still kind of being the game like distilling with, uh, sorry with that said sorry to interrupt you but no, by uh, all means. with that said may i ask you a question by all means feel free D- if you uh showed pac-man championship edition dx plus to a victorian orphan do you think that their entire body would explode or just uh, their brain? So that's a, a very interesting question, and I'm going to answer it. I'm going to use the answering it of a transition to my own set of nonsensical questions since you beat me to it. Um, uh-huh. I think it would be... So do you remember in um, Raiders of the Lost Ark where they lift the the uh the 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 arc of the covenant they lift the lid and then it melts everyone's faces effectively i think of course. It would i think that's how it would work out i think that's what we would see so i think it would be everything <laughs> okay yeah a, a complete uh dissolution of body and mind uh in a, in a holistic uh in a, in a holistic ego death i appreciate it yeah um so yeah so I think that's I think that's a fair <laughs> way to go about it. Now, usually I'm not used. Well, these are newer. Um, the lightning round questions, as I as I'm starting to call them, and you know, uh, these are newer, so I'm off guard being asked it. So I hope that I catch you equally off guard with a few of these as well. Now, these are just meant to be little random, quick, lighthearted, nonsensical things. So by all means, there's not going to be any judgment for how you answer them. You can just fire off whatever you see fit, quick whatever you know whatever 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 i'm just gonna round it up with this one so i'm gonna hit you with two and they're the first two are random i'm gonna hit you let you know that one first so the first one is if you were a transformer is there a vehicle you wouldn't transform into on principle alone 
I think an RC car is uh, the transformation choice of a deviant and a pervert. I would never transform into such a thing. Uh, there is no rec. If you're a transformer, transforming into something small like shockwave. Uh, no, is it shockwave or soundwave? I think it's soundwave. Soundwave, I think. Yes, soundwave. Him and his cassettes, if he, if or Megatron turning into a gun. Uh, it's the problem isn't transforming into something small. It's like transforming into a small recon vehicle. If I'm gonna transform into a vehicle. I believe on principle there is a, a degree of uh, announcement that I should make about my presence. I transform into a truck, a car, uh, a moped, but to transform it into an RC car, I believe is, it's like the dinosaur nugget uh, <laughs> abstraction where it's like, okay, a chick, a, a dinosaur became a chicken which got turned into a chicken nugget, which got turned into a dinosaur nugget. Becoming a, an, a, going from being an alien transformer to being a vehicle, to being an abstraction of that vehicle that might even itself transform in a deviation, an abstraction of the original. I think it is, uh, I think it is, it is a demented and toxic choice. I'm, I'm just going to go on pure vibes. If someone told me, told me, oh yeah, I turned into an RC car, I'm immediately suspicious of that person. I would never transform into an RC car. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I I appreciate the walkthrough on that one. Yeah, transforming into an RC car is the equivalent of transforming into a dinosaur nugget, and no reasonable, caring, empathetic human being would do that. You you've given me a few different things to clip there for for the promo. I very much appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. So, lightning question two: what per what personality traits do you feel a pet dog would need to have the name Fox McCloud? So, first of all, he would need one of those really cool glasses that you've only, that has only got like one uh, like piece of glass in it for his tactical readout display. I think any dog who doesn't have that can't be called Fox McCloud. It's a matter of stolen valor. The second thing is the ability <laughs> to pilot a warship uh, through a planet uh, without crashing. I think, well, no. I think you should, the dog should get at, min at maximum two, two crashes. Because we all deserve grace. Uh, we all <laughs> need a second chance. Even Fox McCloud needed three lives. So, uh, the ability to pilot a warship, uh, as well as, uh, a cool piece of, like, half tactical glasses, I think both of those things are needed. Uh, you, you, you cited personality traits, but I do think that the ability to pilot a superpowered jet engine, uh, warship is a personality trait. Very fair. Thank you. I understand where you're coming from with that. Far be it from me to argue, especially with the <laughs> nonsensical questions that I myself have phrased. You know, I'll, I'll allow the rule breaking. <laughs> now, this last one is I have been workshopping this one for a bit. And, you know, the something you posted to Twitter has kind of given me the form and function for how to make this work. And this is a leading question, I know that. Or this is leading in, I, I'm aware. So, you know, I'm going to say, you know, you get woken up at 3 a.m. by a cold call, and it is, you're the law firm that you work for in this hypothetical situation. And okay. they are saying a video game character has been arrested for committing a crime that they want you, because you, you are the expert in representing saving someone from being committed of this crime. Who is calling you? What video game character is in need of your services and what crime have they commit? Uh, and are they wearing a trucker hat? <laughs> so if a video game character is calling me up, I'm thinking they're probably not the brightest uh, light bulb in the room. <laughs> so 
let me let me let me let me let me start narrowing it down just to just to some himbos. Uh, let's see, going through different protagonists, side characters. Okay, I know exactly who it is. It's Barry Wheeler from Alan Wake. Uh, Alan Wake's uh, delightful and let's say uh, exuberant uh, agent. He has been convicted of uh, false advertising after Alan Wake goes away. He's doing this whole set of marketing and promo suggesting all sorts of wild things, aliens, uh, abductions, government plots. And finally, someone has had enough and has arrested him for libel, fraud, false advertising, something like that. And he would have seen my TikToks and he's going, hey, maybe you have a law degree, which is why you think you can get away with all the things you do. Uh, you got to get me out of here. You got to do it. And for Barry, I think I might do it. I might, I might get up on that stand. Uh, someone who has not been licensed by the bar and uh, state his case. So thank you very much here for, for braving that one. I apologize for the rough nature of it. Um, I have it's thought a good of question. Better... I like it. Thank you. I've thought of better ways to workshop it for the future, but I very much appreciate you, uh, the man who does not own a trucker hat, <laughs> um, answering that one for me. I am, uh, for, for context for viewers, uh, the protagonist of Life Eater has a trucker hat, and I've made it very clear that <laughs> a big difference between me and that character is that we don't own a trucker hat, so as long as, as long as we're at least in the development and promotion cycle of that game, I can't own a trucker hat or else, you know, alarm bells will go off, people will get called. Documents will have to get signed. I'll end up in the back of a car. It's going to be a whole thing. <laughs> yes. And, you know, I don't think any of us want that for you. So, yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, Zalavir, uh, we're getting dangerously close to me taking up more time than I should from you. And I don't want to take up any more of it, especially since you were so kind and appreciative, uh, understanding. Um, appreciative is the wrong word. Um but understanding of me screwing up and you've given me more time. I don't want to steal more than I've already uh, unjustly stolen. However, uh, if there was anything else you want to discuss or mention or what you're doing or along those lines, by all means, the floor is yours. And please let everyone know where they can find more information about you. And I'll make sure that that information is in the episode description. No stealing or theft has occurred. This has been delightful. Yep, people can find me at W R I T Nelson at Rit Nelson on all social platforms. You can also find my studio at Strange Scaffold. Uh, I've got some games that I worked on on the horizon that uh, I'd like to draw your attention to as well, including South Park Snow Day, which comes out like a few weeks from now, as well as Defenders Quest Two: Mists of Ruin, which that game had been in development for ten years. And they reached out to me and they were like, they wanted me to, to helm the narrative uh, portion of the game, but they also wanted me to create a production pipeline such that the game got shipped. So I was brought on to co-lead the project as well as do the writing. And not only is that one of my favorite scripts I've ever worked on, the fact that a game went was in development hell for 10 years and then I joined it and now it's shipping soon like about a, a year and a half after i joined the project it feels like a validation of the things that i've made sort of the priority of my career as well as honestly the validation of the of the skill of this team they they really pulled something beautiful together and it was kind of the exact crew to bring this uh sequel to a legit early indie classic uh to life i'm i'm grateful to have contributed to that so at rit nelson at strange scaffold defenders quest 2 and south park's no day coming out soon give those a look so thank you very much and as i said i'll be sure to put those in the episode description um i will i will say this i probably should have said this a little earlier or at some point um 
there, the, by the time that this episode goes live, this game will be out. So you, anyone that's listening, you have the chance to actually play it at the time of this episode being released. And that that is on Mies Elevate oh, for not cool. saying that earlier. So thank you. And yeah, so, you know, then anyone knows that they can check it out. And I also now have an idea of when it's coming out and not just seeing the, the material starting up on, on YouTube ads or what have you. Now, outside of that, though, as I said, I want to let you go. And if there wasn't anything else, I will let you get on of your day and stop stealing your time. No stealing occurred. Thank you so much for having me and have a wonderful rest of your day yourself. You as well. And thanks again to Zalavir for making time to have this conversation with me. And thank you for joining us on the Red Tunic podcast, as well as a special thanks to Ronald Jenkins for the use of music from the title track from Road Steep. And be sure to check out the episode description for links to socials, websites, and other means that will allow you to learn more about or support Zalavir and the podcast. While you're doing that, share, like, follow, whatever else you think makes the algorithm work. Thanks. Till next time.